Funding for the broadcast of the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium was provided in part by Religious Education at Brigham Young University. The following presentation, For a Wise Purpose, was given by Robert Matthews, former Dean of the College of Religious Education. I am honored to be a part of the Sidney B. Sperry 32nd Annual Symposium of the Scriptures, and to be able to talk about the Book of Mormon. Some 40 years ago, Brigham Young University inaugurated a program, a series of talks they called Last Lecture Series. The idea was that if a professor knew that this was to be his last lecture on that subject, he would do the very best he could and he would pick the most persuasive and important arguments. Well, I don't know whether this will be my last lecture or not, but I prepared uh, a lecture with that in mind. Although I've sought the help of the Holy Spirit, I alone am responsible for what I'm about to say. The title of this lecture is For a Wise Purpose, a phrase that is used several times in the Book of Mormon and in the Doctrine and Covenants, and I've noted that the wise purpose has more than one application. The phrase is first used regarding the mechanics of producing and preserving the message engraved on the gold plates of the Book of Mormon 2,500 years ago. Now what the Lord had Nephi do was to make a dual record. He commanded him to make two separate accounts of the history of his people on separate collections of gold plates. One record would be known as the large plates and the other record would be known as the small plates. Forging heavy gold plates by hand and engraving characters upon them is, is hard work. And it would be doubly hard if you had to make two records. Apparently the Lord did not tell Nephi why he wanted him to make those dual records, but he did tell him that it would be for a wise purpose and that it would be made known in future generations. A thousand years after Nephi, while editing the final version of the Book of Mormon, the Prophet Mormon was inspired to include the original small plates along with Mormon's own summary of the large plates. Mormon said he acted by inspiration for a wise purpose, although he said he did not know all that was involved in doing it in including the two records. When Mormon's son, Moroni, hid the records in the Hill Cumorah, he preserved that dual record for future use. Joseph Smith obtained the plates in September 1827 from that same Hill Cumorah. Now I want to talk about what we generally call the lost manuscript. Persons familiar with the translation and the printing of the Book of Mormon know about the loss of 116 pages of manuscript in 1828, only a year after they had the plates, which involved the prophet scribe Martin Harris of Palmyra, New York. We call it the lost manuscript. A more appropriate title would be the stolen manuscript, taken by those who tried to destroy the holy work that the Lord had called Joseph Smith to do. The 116 pages were Joseph Smith's translation from the Plates of Mormon, which began with a book of Lehi and covered a period of approximately 470 years. It's called the Stick of Ephraim. In the Book of Mormon, we, we talk about the, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon being a Stick of Ephraim. It was, it was a, a loss of valuable material to lose those 116 pages of of translation, but there's one thing in there 
that uh, we may be interested in, and that is in the Book of Mormon, when it gives the genealogy of Lehi, it, it indicates he is a descendant of Joseph, but of Joseph's son Manasseh. One time some of the brethren said to the prophet Joseph, well, how is it that the Book of Mormon can be called the Stick of Ephraim when Lehi, the chief character there, and his family were of Manasseh? And the prophet said, well, on the 116 pages, it gave the genealogy of Ishmael, who had the daughters, as you know, and that Ishmael was an Ephraimite. And that's how the blood of Ephraim gets into the Book of Mormon. That's, you can't get that out of the present Book of Mormon because of the loss of the 116 pages. It was not the gold plates that were stolen. It was only the prophet Joseph's translation of it. He could have translated it again, but the Lord counseled him against it and explained that, that he knew it was going to happen and he had provided a remedy way back in the days of Nephi. And the remedy was to use a translation of the more spiritual small plates of Nephi in preference to the more secular uh, record that of the large plates. Now the small plates begin with the book of Nephi, whereas the stolen portion began with the book of Lehi. As a result of this substitution, the book of Lehi does not occur in, in any copy of the Book of Mormon. Now the first edition of the Book of Mormon, and I hold a copy of that right here, had a preface in it. It has not been printed in any edition except the very first edition, and I'd like to read part of that preface to you. The prophet wrote, I would inform you that I translated by the gift and power of God and caused to be written 116 pages, the which I took from the book of Lehi, which was an account abridged from the plates of Lehi by the hand of Mormon which said account some person or persons have stolen and kept from me, notwithstanding my utmost exertions to recover it again, and being commanded of the Lord that I should not translate the same over again, for Satan hath put it into their hearts to tempt the Lord their God by altering the words, that they did read contrary from that which I translated and caused to be written, and if I should bring forth the same words again, they would publish that which they had stolen, and Satan would stir up the hearts of this generation that they might not receive this work. But behold, the Lord said unto me, I will not suffer that Satan shall accomplish his evil design in this thing. Therefore thou shalt translate from the plates of Nephi until ye come to that Art which that you have translated, which ye have retained. And behold, ye shall publish it as the record of Nephi, and thus I will confound those who have altered my words. I will not suffer that they shall destroy my work. Yea, I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. Wherefore, to be obedient unto the commandments of God, I have, through his grace and mercy, accomplished that which he has commanded me respecting this thing. It must have been a painful frustration to those Palmyra pirates who, when they opened their first copy of the Book of Mormon, only to find that they, as the servants of Satan, had been outmaneuvered by the God of Joseph Smith. Now, the marvelous as the Palmyra instance was, and the wise purpose of the Lord in preparing against that, that's not the only wise purpose that the Book of Mormon has to offer. Every subject and topic that's been presented in this symposium reflects the wise purpose of the Lord in preserving and presenting to the world a Book of Mormon. It is concerning some of those other precise doctrines that are preserved in the Book of Mormon that I would like to speak for the remainder of this essay. The Book of Mormon affirms that God has a plan of happiness for mankind, that mortal life is a probation, 
That individual intelligent life continues after the death of the mortal body. That every person's spirit and body will be permanently reunited in a resurrection and receive a just judgment from God according to one's works. This plan, called the plan of redemption or the plan of salvation, is put into operation only because of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. The central theme of the Book of Mormon is that Jesus Christ is mankind's only source for salvation and presents 101 name titles, each of which defines Jesus' character and redeeming mission. These 101 name titles are repeated for a total of 3,925 times in the Book of Mormon. We are indebted to Sister Susan Easton Black for providing those statistics. The witness for Christ flows continually through the entire book. There are 239 chapters in the Book of Mormon, and only six do not mention the name of the Lord, and those six are dealing with war. The world does not really know Christ. In the modern world, there is a growing rejection of Jesus Christ as the divine redeemer. It is a sophisticated, intellectual, and sociological approach to Christ generally denying his godhood, his miracles, his physical resurrection from the tomb. Many persons of learning seriously question if Jesus Christ ever lived upon the earth at all. They speak of the Jesus of history as being different from the Jesus of faith. In other words, what they mean is that the Jesus of the Bible that people believe in did not actually exist was not divine, performed no miracles, did not make an atonement with his precious blood, nor did he rise from the dead in a resurrection, nor did he conquer death and sin for mankind. Many of these faithless views are promoted by pastors and teachers in traditional Christian churches in the 20th and 21st centuries. It appears that their doctrinal foundation has crumbled, even though they have a Bible in the pulpit. With many, the Bible no longer has divine authenticity. The Lord knew that this rejection of Jesus and of the Bible would be widespread in the earth in the last days, and so he provided the Book of Mormon as a fresh second witness for the real Jesus and for the real Bible. Because of the plain language of the Book of Mormon, it is in many ways a stronger, more revealing, and more particular testament for Jesus Christ than is the New Testament. It also shows that the prophets from the time of Adam to the present have all been Christian prophets, and every dispensation was a Christian dispensation with the same gospel, the same ordinances, the same plan of salvation centered in Christ. The following Book of Mormon statements that we're going to quote and use about Jesus Christ are more clear than anything in the Bible. When Book of Mormon prophets spoke of Christ, they often used superlatives, absolutes, ultimates. They used terms like the most, the greatest, the only, and so forth. They also set forth great contrasts, and you will notice that as in the examples that we use. The prophet Alma said, there be many things to come, and behold, there is one thing of more importance than they all. The time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. He shall be born of Mary, she being a virgin, who shall bring forth the Son of God. Centuries before Alma, Nephi reported that he had seen a vision of a most beautiful and fair virgin in the city of Nazareth, that an angel told Nephi that the virgin is the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. He also saw the virgin bearing a child in her arms. The angel said, Behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. 
Nephi also beheld that the love of God, which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men, is made manifest in the coming of the Son of God to the earth, and is possible only by what he called the condescension of God. The love of God is described, and notice now the superlatives, this love of God is described as the most desirable of all things and the most joyous to the soul. Notice the definite uh, nature of the message. Several years ago on this campus, there was a very distinguished and very pleasant um, Lutheran minister was called to, was invited to come and speak and was asked to talk about uh, the Savior's sermon in Third Nephi and compare it with the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I was there in the audience to listen to him. He gave a most marvelous and uh, really uh, careful study of those two sermons. As he went through the, the comparisons of the Sermon on the Mount with a similar sermon in Third Nephi, he uh, kept pointing out how much more clear the third Nephi sermon was than the, than the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I sat there amazed. I thought, I can hardly believe it. But he's, he's making a wonderful case for the Book of Mormon. After 30 or 40 minutes of illustrating several such cases of the superiority and clarity of the Book of Mormon, then he said, well, it's, it's plain that the, the, the Book of Mormon is much, much clearer than the Bible. But he said, that's a problem. He said, new and young religions always want answers. When you get more mature in, 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 in your faith, he said, you like the, the vagary of the Bible because you can interpret it any way you want. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, I learned something from him about the clarity of the Book of Mormon. I just didn't agree with his interpretation. Well, one of the things about the Book of Mormon is what it says about Jesus. Jesus is a God. Why the great emphasis on Jesus above all others? Because only Jesus can give what mankind most desperately needs and which men are totally unable to provide for themselves. Only Jesus could make an atonement only Jesus could conquer death and sin. He alone, of all the people that have ever lived upon the earth, is a God. He's not only a God, he's an infinite God. Book of Mormon prophets repeatedly use the word infinite when speaking of Jesus. Nephi said that the atonement is infinite for all mankind. The perspective Amulek said, for it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, yea, not a sacrifice of man, neither of beast, neither of any manner of fowl, for it shall not be a human sacrifice. It must be an infinite and eternal sacrifice. Now there is not any man that can sacrifice his own blood that which it will atone for the sins of another, Therefore, there can be nothing which is short of an infinite atonement which will suffice for the sins of the world. The inspired theologian Jacob explained, it must needs be an infinite atonement or it could not redeem either man's body or his spirit. All of these foregoing passages place Jesus in the most preeminent status of any person that has ever lived on this earth. But now what if there were no atonement? What would the consequences be for the human family if no atonement were made? Nephi and Amulek both said that without the atonement, all mankind would perish. But I want to talk about what does perish mean in that context? Jacob, the great doctrinarian, explained that in such cases, no atonement, bodies would be laid down to rot and to crumble to Mother Earth to rise no more, and our spirits would become devils. 
to be shut out from the presence of God in misery forever. That would be the consequence of no atonement. Our bodies would die and go back to Mother Earth. They do that anyway, but we do it in the hope that we don't stay there, whereas without the atonement, there would be no resurrection of the body. But the great contribution of the Book of Mormon on this point is that our spirits would become miserable devils. I hear people talk sometimes, say, oh, you lucky devil, or you handsome devil. There are no lucky devils. There may be some handsome devils, but there are no lucky devils. The devils that, that, that are for real are miserable devils. In gratitude, Jacob cries out, Oh, the, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth the way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, death and hell. Well, just how exclusive is Jesus? How dependent are we upon him? Was there an alternate plan? Is there a backup redeemer? The New Testament seems to answer these questions with Peter's eloquent words spoken a few years, a few weeks after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now here are the words of Peter from the book of Acts. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Likewise, Paul says that there is no other foundation that can be laid than that foundation which Jesus Christ laid. I thought Peter's words were very convincing, as also Paul's. But I once quoted those words to some friends who were wondering if there might have been an alternate emergency plan or an alternate emergency backup savior. When I quoted Paul's and Peter's words, they said, well, that doesn't prove anything, which surprised me because these were believers. They said both of those statements were made after Jesus had made the atonement. That really surprised me. So I right then and there began to appreciate the clarity of the Book of Mormon the clarity beyond what the Bible has on that subject. I noticed the definitions in the Book of Mormon. For example, Nephi wrote almost the identical thought to what Peter said about there being no other name uh, by which salvation can be obtained, but he said it 500 years before it happened. And so, by the definition of my friends, it, Nephi has a stronger case because he says it before it happened, that there will be no other name. Furthermore, King Benjamin left no wiggle room in his definition of the plan, for he said 124 years before the birth of Christ, moreover I say unto you, there shall be no other name given nor any other way nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. He went on to say, the atonement was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind, which ever were since the fall of Adam, or who are or whoever shall be, even unto the end of the world. And this is the means whereby salvation cometh, there is none other salvation save this of which hath been spoken. Neither are there any other conditions whereby man can be saved except the conditions which I have told you. That's Mosiah chapter 4. That's King Benjamin speaking. Now you see how, how tight that is? It's true. It, it absolutely eliminates the opportunity for a backup plan or a, um, an alternate savior. When they, those people first mentioned to me that they thought there was a backup plan, I thought, somehow you can't have faith in a Jesus that's got a backup, you see. Another essential doctrine in the Book of Mormon is the inseparable connection between the fall of Adam and the atonement of Jesus Christ. The severe, intense, and necessary consequences of the fall 
are explained in much greater detail in the Book of Mormon than they are in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 has a brief account of the transgression of Adam and Eve, but develops no doctrine of the fall. After the fifth chapter of Genesis, Adam is seldom even mentioned in the Bible. In the New Testament, only Paul discusses the doctrine of the fall and its relationship to the atonement of Christ. And he does it briefly. Beyond Genesis, the Bible mentions Adam only 12 times. And some of these are one-word entries in genealogical lists. In sharp contrast, the Book of Mormon abounds in passages about Adam and the fall, and Adam is mentioned by name 25 times, mostly in doctrinal discussions about the fall and the atonement. Who in the Book of Mormon taught the doctrine of the fall? No less than Lehi, Nephi, Jacob, King Benjamin, Abinadi, both Almas, Ammon, Aaron, Amulek, Samuel the Lamanite, Mormon, Moroni, and the brother of Jared. The following quotes will illustrate the particular clarity of the Book of Mormon. The great visionary Lehi explained that without the fall, Adam and Eve would have had no children, which is a major doctrinal statement because it makes the fall a necessary thing. Lehi also said that without the fall, all things must have remained forever without death, which is another major doctrinal declaration. Lehi continued, but behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. These statements by Lehi place the fall as an essential step in the plan of salvation. They also face up to the theory of organic evolution as man's origin. King Benjamin explained, the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam, will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, putteth off the natural man, becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. And Moroni gives this tidy summary. Behold, God created Adam, by Adam came the fall, because of the fall came Jesus Christ, even the Father and the Son, and because of Jesus came the redemption of man. Uh, one quick eternal doctrine after another, just one sentence. Well, let's talk about the resurrection. Jesus convincingly demonstrated his physical resurrection by showing his body to about 2,500 persons and asking them to come and touch it. In a dramatic scene, the Father spoke from the sky and introduced Jesus as Jesus descended to the earth and came and stood before the people. Jesus declared that he was himself the Son of God. And then he said, Arise and come forth unto me that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel, and the God of the whole earth have been slain for the sins of the world. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet, and this they did do, going forth one by one until they had all gone forth, and did see with their eyes and did feel with their hands and did know of a surety and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. And when they had all gone forth, and had witnessed for themselves, they did cry out with one accord, saying, Hosanna. Blessed be the name of the Most High God. And they did fall down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. Other men could teach doctrine 
Other men could administer ordinances, but only Jesus could atone and conquer death. He came in person to assure the people that the resurrection was real and that he was real. Who taught the doctrine of resurrection in the Book of Mormon? Nearly every prophet that is quoted taught it. They're the same prophets who taught about the fall of Adam. Another concept that's taught very clearly in the Book of Mormon is that blessings can come immediately. Salvation is set in motion and the blessings of the gospel begin to be felt as soon as a person believes in Jesus and repents of sin. King Benjamin, King Benjamin's people, immediately felt great joy, peace of conscience, remission of sins, and a mighty change of heart. Because of their exceeding faith in Jesus Christ. When Alma was racked with spiritual pain because of his many sins, he remembered what his father had said about Jesus' atonement. Now notice the use of contrast here. Here are the words of Alma, chapter 36. Now as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness and am encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. Now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Yea, I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more. And oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy, as exceeding as was my pain. Yea, I say unto you, my son, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, and again I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there can be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. We see how forcefully the Book of Mormon teaches the points of Christ's doctrine. Not in competition to the Bible, but as a witness for the truth of the Bible. And that if a person believes one record, he should believe both records. We know the Bible is true because we know that the Book of Mormon is true. This is one of the Lord's wise purposes in making the Book of Mormon available to us to testify of the truth of the Bible, but to testify it as it was when it was originally written. The Prophet Joseph Smith spoke of the Book of Mormon as the keystone of our religion. I suppose it is the keystone because it is definite it sets a standard, and it holds the fundamental doctrines in place, not allowing multiple interpretations or room to hedge. Without the Book of Mormon, the blind lead the blind, or in many cases, the bland lead the bland, you see. Elder Orson Pratt described the Book of Mormon perfectly. He said, the nature of the message of the Book of Mormon is such that if it is true, no one can possibly be saved if he rejects it. But if the Book of Mormon is false, no one can possibly be saved if he receives it. Because it's not a neutral book, you see. Precise fulfillment of prophecy. By divine direction, Father Lehi declared that wicked Jerusalem would be destroyed, many Jews would be slain, and others were would be taken captive into Babylon. Before the destruction, the Lord led Lehi and his family out of Jerusalem and into the Western Hemisphere, where he learned by vision that the word of the Lord was verified and Jerusalem had truly been destroyed by the Babylonians. One of Mormon's inspired editorial accomplishments was to show that the word of the Lord spoken by his chosen prophets is always fulfilled to the letter. Mormon makes certain that the reader knows that the prophecies of Alma and Amulek 
concerning the destruction of the wicked city Ammonihah were completely fulfilled. Likewise, with much detail, Mormon rehearses Abinadi's fiery prophecies about the coming destruction upon wicked King Noah and that the priests of Noah would put people to death by fire and also some of them would suffer death by fire. Also that there would come a curse upon the land and it would be infested. And these are quotes from the Book of Mormon. The land would be infested with sorceries, witchcrafts, and magics. Mormon shows that all of the pronouncements by Abinadi were categorically fulfilled. In order that the readers will not fail to get the point, both Nephi and Mormon and also Moroni use a little literary device like this. They would say, behold, I will show unto you that. And then they tell you what, you, what, the, what they want you to get out of that little chapter. Or sometimes they put it at the end and after they've told you the event, then they say, and thus we see that. And that's because they want to make sure we got the message. Father Lehi's prophecies of a prosperous time for his posterity when they are righteous, but terrible troubles if they become wicked were literally fulfilled several times within the scope of the Book of Mormon, as Mormon is careful to remind the reader. Also, the prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite of a night without darkness at Christ's birth and three days with nothing but darkness at his death accompanied by earthquakes, storms, and tumults. Also, the tools and weapons would become slippery and be hard to maintain. These things are all carefully shown by Mormon to have been precisely fulfilled. The marvelously persistent Samuel had also prophesied that many saints would be resurrected after Jesus' resurrection. This was literally fulfilled. But when Jesus visited the people and knowing that the fulfillment had not been recorded in their record, said to Nephi, bring the record to me. And they brought the record. And he said, did not Samuel prophesy of these things? And they said, yes. And then Jesus said, how is it you did not write that in the book? Now, it isn't just a matter of saying Samuel prophesied of it. What Jesus was interested in was it was fulfilled. He commanded that both the prophecy and the exact fulfillment be entered into the book. You know about that. That's 3 Nephi chapter 23. The most significant fulfillment of prophecy was the birth of Jesus Christ, his atonement, his miracles, his resurrection, his, his visit to the Western Hemisphere. Many vocal unbelievers at that time said it was not reasonable that such a being of Christ, as Christ should come. And they planned to put to death all of those who believed in the prophecies. It was Satan who planted these doubts in their minds. Mormon shows that the prophecies were literally fulfilled, and he tells us that the voice of the Lord came to Nephi, saying, I will show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be written by the mouth of my holy prophets, from the time of the foundation of the world. The sign of Christ's birth was given. The unbelievers were frustrated. 34 years later, the special signs of Christ's death were given. Darkness, earthquakes, storms, and tumults. And many people were slain. Faithful and industrious Mormon is careful to record all these things in detail. And then he gives this explanation and warning. This is a marvelous statement from 3 Nephi chapter 10. And now whoso readeth, let him understand. He that hath the scriptures, let him search them. And see and behold if all these deaths and destructions by fire and by smoke and by tempests and by whirlwinds and by the opening of the earth to receive them and all these things are not unto the fulfilling of the prophecies of many of the holy prophets. Now, for a moment, talk about the inspired pronouncement from the Book of Mormon concerning the Bible. By heavenly visions and the guidance of a holy angel, 
Nephi was shown what would happen to the record of the Jews, consisting of the writings of the Old Testament prophets and the writings of the New Testament apostles. This inspired pronouncement about the Bible is recorded in 1st Nephi chapter 13 and also in chapter 14. Number one, the Bible containing the covenants of the Lord and the fullness of the gospel was originally plain and easy to understand. Number two, this Jewish Bible was deliberately altered by the great and abominable Gentile church which took many plain and most precious parts and many covenants and much gospel out of the book. Number three, alterations to the text were made deliberately to pervert the right ways of the Lord. Number four, the alterations were done early for it was after the Bible was altered that it went forth to all the nations of the Gentiles. That's such an important point, and the Book of Mormon says it so clearly. The world never has had a complete and accurate Bible because it was altered, altered in not a good way, before it was distributed. Number five, because many precious parts are kept back and taken out of the Bible and out of the Gospel, many persons stumble and are in an awful state of blindness. Number six, to rescue the world from this spiritual blindness, the Lord will bring forth the Book of Mormon and other books to make known the plain and precious things that have been taken away from the Bible. We could look at these other books as being the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Prize, and I would add two more. One would be the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, which he did by divine appointment and by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and another category, other books that may yet come forth, you see. Number seven, the Book of Mormon and the other books will establish the truth of the original Bible. Now deliberate changes are more destructive than accidental changes because they target doctrinal passages and are cleverly done so that the loss to the passage is not easily uh, detected. Also deliberate changes can be done very quickly. Now a lesson from the lost or stolen manuscript. It is my experience that many members of the church do not realize how severely the Bible has been altered. Some have said to me that they do not think that the Lord would permit sacred scripture to be altered by wicked people. My response to that is they should look to the Book of Mormon for help on that point. For not only does the Book of Mormon say that the early Bible manuscripts were deliberately altered by abominable persons, but it provides a parallel to the theft, to the changing and the loss of 116 pages of the Book of Lehi. Believers in the Book of Mormon and in the history of Joseph Smith should have no difficulty in understanding that early manuscripts of the Bible were severely changed and reduced in content, since our Book of Mormon went through the same type of attack. If 116 pages can be lost in the first year that Joseph had the plates, what could happen to a Bible in three or four centuries, or five or six centuries? Thieves altering scripture in Palmyra were typical of other thieves at other times in other lands who were tampered with the sacred biblical scripture. Satan hates good scripture, and it is part of his long war against Christ, which began in the premortal life. But part of the long war against Christ is for Satan to attack the scriptures that testify of Christ in an attempt to destroy his divinity, to mock his miracles, and to rescind his resurrection. The great apostasy of the last 19 centuries left the world without an adequate church. It also left the world without an adequate Bible, and it left the world without an adequate body of doctrine. In all these cases, new revelation was necessary to recover that which was lost. I might uh, cite a little homey experience of this. Once in a while, I do get a haircut. 
Sometimes when I'm waiting my turn, there's a person in the chair ahead of me with lots of hair. And so when he's about through and it's my turn next, I walk up to the, to the chair before he gets out. And I say to the barber, I've done this many barber shops many times, make me look like him. And the barber looks at me and looks at him and says, can. Well, why not? It's too late. <laughs> what's left, we cannot make out of what's left what, what you want me to do with this man that has lots of hair. Now, can you see the parallel? What I'm saying is the Bible is a wonderful book, but even as clear as the Book of Mormon is, it says many plain and precious things have been taken out, and as a result, it does no longer contain the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, it's just a little bit like that when I want a haircut. They cannot make me look what, like what I haven't got. So it isn't a matter of translation. There are plenty of people on this campus, there are plenty of people in, in the church and in the world that are excellent at translating biblical languages. The problem is an adequate manuscript to translate from. Well, in all these cases, new revelation was necessary to recover what was lost. In my own opinion, the Bible has been ravaged much more than most of us realize, yet it still conveys the basic truth that Jesus is the Messiah, although many necessary details are missing and they needed to be restored. Why the gold plates were hidden in the earth. The Book of Mormon repeatedly speaks of the gold plates being hidden in the earth for safekeeping. Thus hidden, no human could alter or destroy the records. And it was thus preserved in its original sense, the same as when they were written. The Book of Mormon had to be protected from the loss of clarity that the Bible has gone through in order that it could do what the Lord in his wisdom proposed it to do, and that is to be a witness for the real Christ and for the real Bible. To faithful Nephi, the Lord declared that he speaks the same words to one nation as he does unto another, and they shall write it. Unless the Bible and the Book of Mormon originally had the same points of doctrine, one could not be a valid witness for the other. Thus we conclude that originally the Bible was as doctrinally plain and precise as the Book of Mormon is. The Bible is still wonderful, but it's just less clear or complete than it once was. I think it might be an insult to the biblical prophets and apostles if we suppose that they did not have the ability to explain the doctrines and the ordinances of the gospel with the same great clarity in which those are written in the Book of Mormon and in the Doctrine and Covenants. Surely those ancient apostles and prophets knew the gospel as well as we do. And surely they wrote it as well as the Book of Mormon is written, but there has been mischief done with the text of the Bible. And thus the Lord prepared a second witness, another witness for Jesus Christ, but had it buried in the earth where it would be out of reach of designing people, you see. As a divinely revealed original record, the Book of Mormon deserves to be used by scholars and laymen alike as a major documentary source for understanding the original doctrines of the Bible. Surely the Lord expects us to do this. Surely this is one of the wise purposes. Now the message of the Book of Mormon is heavier than the gold plates on which it was written and is the keystone of the doctrine in the, of the church. The wise purpose of the Lord causing the book to be written thousands of years ago, then hidden in the earth and then could come forth in the last days is declared by the Lord himself in Doctrine and Covenants section three. Now I'm just going to read part of this. It's quite an interesting statement. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in section three of the Doctrine and Covenants. Inasmuch as the knowledge of a savior has come into the world through the testimony of the Jews, even so shall the knowledge of a savior come unto my people the Nephites, the Jacobites, the Josephites, and the Zoramites, 
through the testimony of their fathers. And this testimony shall come to the knowledge of the Lamanites. In other words, the Lord's saying, we've got a Bible and it tells about Jesus. We, we need a record from these other people and their ancestors who knew the, the gospel and testified of Jesus. And now the Lord says this, and for this very purpose are these plates, that's the Book of Mormon plates, for this very purpose are these plates preserved which contain these records that the promises of the Lord might be fulfilled which he made to his people and that the Lamanites might come to the knowledge of their fathers that they might know the promises of the Lord that they might believe the gospel rely upon the merits of Christ and be glorified through faith in his name that through their repentance they might be saved. Now, my testimony is that this declaration from the Lord says that if the Book of Mormon did not come forth in the last days to testify of the true faith of Christ, salvation could not come to this generation. That's what I hear the Lord saying in section three. It is the Lord's instrument to bring people to a true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, surely it is a work and a wonder. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This presentation was given at the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 25, 2003. Funding for the broadcast of the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium was provided in part by Religious Education at Brigham Young University.